Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, greetings from London. I'm sorry I couldn't make it to Long Island. It's a very great pleasure to be invited to take part in this uh, conference on Hiari and Sundamailia. And it's a particular honor to be invited to uh, give a keynote speech at this prestigious meeting and also to chair the discussion and, and this session. So I, my brief is comorbid conditions associated with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and I've added a little subheading, hypermobility and its relevance to Chiari 1 and related conditions. Now, if Hans Chiari was with us here today, uh, he would be a bit perplexed about the concept of linking Chiari syndrome uh, with one of his syndromes with um, hypermobility. And the reason for that is it's not his fault because the first uh, publication or case history of a patient with um, joint laxity, uh, familial joint laxity, was made by uh, an orthopedic surgeon in, in New York City uh, in 1916. Uh, his name was uh, Mr. Finkelstein. And it was, sadly, the year that Hans Chiari died. So it was, took some time. This, this is, in fact, is the key uh, slide that relates to the uh, major study in 2007, which linked um, Chiari 1 and Pacifica uh, Atlantoaxial hypermobility, cranial setting by Millerat uh, and Bolognese, uh, Nicky Shaw, McDonald, and Frank Amano. And they established <coughs> that out of a large series of um, nearly 3,000 patients with Chiari 1, no less than 357, 12.7%, uh, um, had a heritable disorder of connective tissue. Um, they made some other interesting observations that, to suggest that the Chiari 1 patients with a heritable disorder of connective tissue differed in certain respects from those who didn't have um, uh, a heritable disorder. Uh, and I expect this uh, paper and its findings as common knowledge to the audience here today. So I'm going to um, fast forward to 2013 when um, <clears throat> I became uh, first aware uh, of this important uh, observation and I was very privileged to attend this uh, symposium in um, San Francisco um, and to meet many of you who are attending this meeting today in, in Long Island and other colleagues who were working in this field. And I was extremely impressed with, with the interest, the, the scientific endeavor, and, and the widespread involvement of people from all over the world. And it's been a great source of inspiration for me to become interested in, in, in this particular area. Let's go back to hypermobility and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. It was in 1967 uh, that Kirk Ansell and Bywaters um, published the first report of hypermobility in the rheumatological uh, literature. I should say that I, I am uh, a rheumatologist. And I just happened to be working in the hospital where they were working in 1967 called the Hammersmith Hospital in London. And although I wasn't involved in the initial work, uh, I, I was aware that it was taking place. And they defined the hypermobility syndrome as the occurrence of musculoskeletal symptoms in the presence of generalized joint laxity in otherwise normal subjects. So they regarded this as a manifestation of normality apart from the fact that these people happen to be uh, hypermobile as a result of their joint laxity. 
as it turns out and will become apparent as we go through the next uh, part of my talk, these were not normal subjects and um, they in fact showed increasing evidence as time went by uh, of having themselves uh, an underlying connective tissue disorder. So the nature of inherent hypermobility, it is a genetic disorder. Um, there is a central role of collagen genes and possibly uh, in other in certain instances, uh, genes uh, encoding for other um, proteins of the matrix of connective tissue. But it does affect the nature, the physical and biomechanical nature of uh, collagen, uh, rendering ligaments and other collagen bearing tissues more elastic, stretchier, uh, and more fragile. And this leads to problems that we'll talk about shortly. It affects the supporting structures uh, of the joint, which are the ligaments, uh, allowing them to, dis get, to dislocate with greater ease and at the same time provides uh, an enhanced range of movement, which is what we call hypermobility. It affects posture. The subjects are vulnerable to uh, injury and it's not just uh, acute injury, it also affects what we might call chronic injury. Um, overuse injury is another term that's used. And it does affect healing as well because, of course, collagen isn't just a supporting structure, it is the main component of scar tissue. So that if the collagen is impaired, it's going to affect the ability to heal. And this is shown um, uh, in, to be affected. We also subsequently learned that there was more than just um, weakness and fragility of collagen, but because there was other things happening. And this took a, a decade or two to become apparent. But um, when it did become apparent, um, it became obvious that there were other mechanisms uh, active which were causing patients problems. For instance, pain was became enhanced. Not just the pain of injury, but the pain generally and chronic pain became a part of the scene. Um, there was evidence of proprioceptive impairment in patients with joint hypermobility syndrome. Uh, and as you see there, lack of efficacy of local anesthetics was um, uh, established um, and subsequent to that autonomic dysfunction. So the, the clinical picture, the phenotype um, started to become more diffuse and to involve parts of the body that were outside the musculoskeletal symptom, system. So let's think a little bit about the kind of proteins that we're talking about. Although collagen is the prototype, and the one that's um, best known, uh, it does affect uh, other proteins of the connective tissue matrix. And um, these are four that are shown to be involved in different um, diseases, which I will refer to in a minute. But staying with collagen for a moment, this is a scanning electron microscopic picture of a collagen fibril, and you can see uh, from its appearance that it, it, it sort of exudes uh, physical strength. It is by far the most uh, strong of all the proteins in the body, and it also happens to be the most widely distributed. Now, the reason for its uh, strength uh, it results from the nature of its production. Here we see in diagrammatic form a fibroblast cell uh, in the process of manufacturing um, pro-collagen uh, 
uh, molecules. And the structure is based on a triple helix, three strands, uh, polypeptide strands are wound around each other and the strength of the molecule is guaranteed by the fact that there are chemical bonds uh, between the within the within the molecule between the strands and also between the molecules themselves so the end result is something that uh, in biological terms is very extraordinary in terms of strength um, to give you an example of that here's a, um, a table of um, the modulus of elasticity um, involved in a number of materials, starting with smooth muscle, which is one of the stretchiest of all biological tissues, and ending up with steel. And you see that collagen fibers, now I'm talking about normal collagen fibers, um, sit neatly between, um, uh, actually, I think that's not the right order. I think it's between rubber and willow. Um, where the, the, that should be placed, the third one. Still, it's very respectable uh, sitting there, and um, uh, it's not surprising, therefore, that when the tensile strength of collagen is reduced, um, it's felt um, by the patient um, in a variety of ways. So this is a, a schematic drawing of the kind of scenario that is taking place. We start with a genetic anomaly, uh, and I must say that uh, the science of um, molecular genetics has made a considerable contribution to our understanding of this field uh, over the last 20 or 25 years. Uh, but there are still uh, areas where the genetic cause uh, of uh, hypermobility is has yet to be discovered. And this, of course, uh, is particularly um, important in relation to the most common form of uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, the hypermobile form. We think there is almost certainly one or more genetic uh, causes for this, but it's in the other forms of Ehlers-Danlos, such as the vascular and the classic type. And, and others as well, uh, where the precise genetic cause has been established. So that the genetic anomaly results in a biochemical abnormality, which in turn uh, leads to a biomechanical defect. Uh, now this has two consequences. Um, on the right of, of the diagram, you see one consequence, which might be called the, the good one, which is tissue laxity, because this enables and promotes movement, and it is the essential component of uh, the needs of uh, um, professional, professional dancers and gymnasts and performers uh, generally. Um, the other side of the picture is fragility. This is the downside because um, it's all very well having a flexibility and being able to do wondrous things with one's body, but uh, at the cost of um, the difficulty of maintaining the tensile strength. And the result, of course, is injury. Uh, and this is, as I've already said, is uh, an end point um, which causes problems to people who are in the very professions that I referred to before. And not only injury, but impaired he healing, um, because as I mentioned, the collagen is an integral part of um, the healing process. It is the nature of scar tissue itself. Now, the heritable disorder of connective tissue basically is a family of uh, disorders um, which have been described over the last uh, 100 um, 20 years, uh, Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in its various forms, um, 
Osteogenesis Imperfecta and there is, as I've said, since 1967, this curious entity um, which rheumatologists refer to as the joint hypermobility syndrome. It took a long time, uh, as you'll hear, uh, for the penny to drop uh, that the joint hypermobility syndrome um, and the hypermobile form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome are almost certainly one and the same. The nine point Bison scale is the sort of uh, hallmark um, standard method of uh, recognizing, identifying hypermobility. And as you can see, uh, it's a, based on a nine point scoring system, um, which was introduced by Peter Bison in the 1970s. Uh, while he was undertaking epidemiological work on joint hypermobility in, in southern Africa. The problem with it is that um, it, as, you, as um, is obvious, you're dealing only with uh, five uh, joints of the body. Um, the reason there are nine points is that uh, four of them are matched left and, and right. So it's been it's had a good innings. It's been um, used uh, over since 1973, uh, and it's certainly caught on. And um, uh, but it should be remembered that it is only a screening test, uh, and it was never meant to be a clinical tool. So this alone cannot be sufficient uh, information on which to make a uh, definitive diagnosis but it's a, a way in, as it were, to looking into the situation. You don't actually have to do a formal test to um, identify hypermobility. You just ask, ask people to stretch their fingers. Sometimes you get this uh, um, hyperextension of the um, intervertebral joints, sorry, interphalangeal joints. Um, sometimes, uh, this is probably the more common response, if you ask somebody to stretch their fingers, you will see that the fingers go into hyperextension, uh, and that tells you an awful lot. Uh, and you can test the interphalangeal joint of the thumb and the distal interphalangeal joint of the finger as well. Uh, you don't have hard to look, and quite often you can see, you can identify hypermobility um, across the crowded room, by the way people sit and um, the way they hold their hands, their head, and their couch, their chin and their hands, you can see at a glance. Of course, flattening of the longitudinal arch and pronation of the uh, forefoot and inversion of the hind foot uh, are very frequent uh, features that can help to identify uh, interventional, the first metatarsophalangeal joint is also um, one. I think um, the more one gets away from the biting score, the, the better, uh, because in fact, one can determine hypermobility uh, in clinical uh, situations of shoulders, cervical spine, um, thoracic spine, um, hips, and um, as well as the feet, simply by observing how patients uh, sit and compose themselves. Uh, subluxing of the um, first metacarpophalangeal joint is another very common um, feature. Uh, and here's an interesting one. This is all the same patient. And on the left, you see uh, what, to all intents and purposes, is uh, a normal uh, longitudinal arch. But as soon as the patient is weight-bearing, as you see on the right, you can see a um, marked um, flapping uh, of the longitudinal arch, the pronation of the forefoot, and marked um, calcane in the version of the hind foot. I'd like to point out the 
narrowness of the tender Achilles uh, visible in this patient uh, when standing. And I often ask students why that should be. And I, my answer is um, this is a collagen deficiency disorder as well as uh, a disorder of um, tensile strength. And there's less collagen. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, of course, why um, rupture of the tendon Achilles is, is such an important um, complication. So this little boy whose eyes is just out of the picture uh, is what is actually sublapsing his um, first uh, carpal metal carpal light. And children uh, have difficulties with handwriting and holding a pen, as you can see this little a uh, fellow who's uh, holding a pen, trying to colour in uh, the book. Um, and um, it is a very important aspect of the care of the children with high mobility that uh, their handwriting um, skills are helped uh, by our, our occupational therapy colleagues. Another interesting feature of, of high mobility, which is unique to high mobility, is the clicking of joints that occur during use. And um, I think people have pondered as to why the joints click and why is it only hypermobile joints that click? Uh, and I think this slide will help to answer that question. Um, as you can see on the left-hand side of the picture, um, the, you can't see the finger being distracted, but it is actually being distracted. And there's a little dimple under uh, overlying the metacarpal you know, pharyngeal joint. Uh, and this is, you can see that the capsule is actually being uh, sucked into the joint uh, because uh, the fingers are distracted, the joint is being distracted. And very neatly on the right, this is not the same patient, you can see that the joint space is widened and that the joint space is darker than in the adjacent non-distracted joint. Uh, and the, um, what it reveals is that a gas bubble has appeared. And that's almost certainly the basis of clicking uh, joints in hypermobile people. Right. A few words about the uh, Marfanoid habitus. Uh, a, a lot of doctors um, somehow assume that because somebody has um, Marfanoid features that they must have Marfan syndrome. Now I think this is incorrect. Uh, the Marfanoid habitus in fact is a very useful um, component uh, of heritable connective tissue disorder, because it, it tells you that there is um, a disorder within this family. And the Marfanoid habitus, in fact, appears in um, various different forms, including Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Uh, and my um, observations have suggested that incomplete forms are probably much more common within this group than um, the, the complete forms, which are perhaps more frequently represented in um, Marfan syndrome itself. Obviously, it's very important not to overlook Marfan syndrome um, and echocardiography uh, has been a great boon in starting that process. Uh, here we see um, a rundown of the features of Marfanoid habitus, arachnodactyly. I'll show, you, I'll show you the pictures of the Steinberg and the science in a moment. I think most people know about the high arch palate, scoliosis, the pectus deformity, whether it's uh, carinatum or excavatum. And these measurements, which are so easily performed in the clinic, uh, that should be part of every routine examination. 
span height, uh, upper segment lower segment ratios, uh, hand height, hand height ratio, and foot height ratio. Um, the, these were all introduced by Victor McCusick uh, and have um, uh, been very helpful and in daily practice. And when it first became apparent that there was more to hypermobility uh, of joints in this syndrome, um, it didn't come quickly, it came very slowly. And this just shows um, a study that I was involved in 19, as far back as 1981, which showed that one of the features of the Marfan habitus, um, upper segment over lower segment ratio, being less than 0 0.89, was significant. More common in a small group of hypermobile patients compared with controls. Here we have the Steinberg test, um, the thumb uh, adapted across the palm with the fingers uh, closed round, um, with the finger projecting beyond the, on the border of the, well, the femur eminence. Uh, and the other one is the wrist sign, where um, because of the slender wrists and the long fingers, there is this ability to encircle the wrist with the uh, contralateral thumb and little finger, so that the nail length um, overlap to that, to the extent of one nail length. Now, I started my interest in this field, uh, as you can see, um, first publication was in 1969, in, with, with, again with Peter Biden. And um, I was asked by my boss to take a, a suction tube and try and develop a method for measuring the skin change in the disease scleroderma, which was um, something that I tried but failed to do. But as it were, in in passing, almost by accident, stumbled across a method of measuring uh, skin elasticity in the intact in, in vivo situation. Um, and um, this is me in 1970 with my poor secretary being experimented on using the suction cup. Now, what was possible? using this apparatus was to establish a stress strain curve for um, human skin in vivo. And um, one of the first groups of patients that we uh, tested for obvious reasons was a group of patients with ehlers danlos syndrome who were known to have stretchy skin. And what was the, I think what was the important uh, finding was that there was clear difference in the stress strain curve, in the shape of the curve. Um, on the left, you see um, the control subject, where you've got this um, L-shaped curve, J-shaped curve. Um, but compared to the control subject, the Elders Danlos uh, subject, uh, showed a more marked curve, uh, more marked J effect. And this showed that the skin in EDS was behaving very differently when it stretched from, from the normal uh, person. And this uh, set me upon a course of establishing um, Here we are. Thank you. Establishing something that has actually become um, an, an integral part of my examination procedure. Mm. 
There we are. When you raise a fold of skin on the back of the hand, you see that it, the stretching process um, results um, uh, in stretching goes all the way up to the bracelet. So I call this a bracelet test because when the skin is lifted, you can see that the bracelet itself is moving. Now this doesn't happen in normal skin. Uh, skin does um, uh, stretch uh, when you when you make a a movement um, maneuver to raise a, a fold like that, but it normally only stretches to a certain degree and only where you're actually pulling it. Um, the reason why EDS skin uh, behaves in this different fashion can be explained by the appearance in the center of the slide of two um, scanning electron microscopic sections. On the left, you see the normal skin with progressively thicker uh, collagen fibers, fibril, in the deeper dermis, uh, compared with the Ehlers-Danlos um, picture on the right, uh, which is much more like a sponge, and it behaves more like a sponge, and it stretches like a sponge. Now, this is, would be another example of somebody with uh, hypermobile EDS uh, showing this uh, stretching process going right up to the wristwatch. Uh, and this is just an, an example of the difference between uh, hypermobile EDS on the left with what might be, uh, certainly is, classical EDS uh, on the right. It's a matter of degree. Uh, but neither of them are actually normal in this picture. Now, I've talked about scar tissue, and many patients with Stanlos uh, syndrome, hypermobility syndrome, um, undergo surgery, um, particularly if those who have the um, misfortune to have the current patellofemoral dislocation. And this is the kind of scar tissue that they end up with for the rest of their lives. It's, it's a widened, it, it's shiny, it's often slightly sunken, and it's, it's, it's figuring. Um, but it's also uh, an important um, point of the diagnosis. Uh, here's um, a wound that has undergone dehiscence, and you're left with a sort of oval-shaped, uh, thin, shiny, um, atrophic scar. And here's another example of uh, a BCG scar, which is different color, it's paler, it's certainly sunken below the surface of the, upper, of the adjacent skin. And another useful diagnostic feature because it is it's the presence of stretch marks, striatropici, which occur predominantly uh, in patients with hypermobility, EDS, uh, during the adolescent growth spurt between the ages, usually between the ages of 11 and 13. Uh, and they are often quite prominent and, again, constitute uh, an important diagnostic feature. Uh, an interesting feature is that um, these same uh, female subjects, the same um, girls who would be going through adolescence here uh, in their 20s becoming um, pregnant mothers are often spared the normal, the normal stretch marks of pregnancy. And my 
explanation for that is that by the time they're they're in their twenties, their skin is fully mature EDS skin, which we know is, is very hyper extensive. Uh, another site of um, Sai would be across the lumbosacral region. Um, and there are other physical signs which are valuable um, in um, diagnosis. Uh, if you're looking for EDS, um, the girl at the top is demonstrating hypermobility of the TMJ joint by managing to insert four fingers uh, in her mouth. The, uh, I think probably the same girl in the lower picture is showing the absence of the limbal frenulum that was described some years ago as, a, as another uh, feature of Arizona syndrome. That would be a normal frenulum for comparison. Gorlin sign, because the tissues of the tongue are uh, stretchy because they are their collagen content, uh, this enables people to touch the nose of the tongue. Uh, and another piece of evidence of abnormal uh, physical properties of connective tissue bearing organs. The piece of genetic papules, um, they're, they're also of interest because uh, they're quite striking, as you see in this uh, example, uh, in the heel, when the person is weight bearing on the heel, you see these little um, nodules, they're not really nodules, they're actually uh, fat hernia through the fascia. Uh, and when the person uh, takes the weight off the heel, they, they disappear. So they are um, valuable um, additional diagnostic features. Just a word about the pelvic floor, because pelvic floor is clearly uh, muscular um, tenderness structure. Uh, and it's not surprising that uh, problems with uh, weakness of the pelvic floor uh, during um, or after childbirth in people uh, with EDS. Now, of course, prolapse of the uterus is not um, Certainly occurring in people with EDS, with women with, with EDS. Um, but outside of uh, pregnancy, um, prolapse would be extremely uncommon. In other words, in nulliparous women and in adolescents or even children, where it may occur in, in subjects with EDS for the very reason of the weakness of their, of their tissues. Obviously, from what I've said before, the variety of um, clinical presentations is vast in hypermobility syndrome. And uh, this very old slide uh, classifies the, the features that may arise in the joint, uh, in the soft tissue, in the spine, and extraarticular. And I don't think this slide has really changed very much in the last 20 years, because we knew all about this even in the early days. Um, but as you can see, a lot of them are overuse injuries, uh, which are common in clinical practice uh, in, in rheumatology, in, in orthopedics, uh, and in sports medicine. Interestingly enough, the three conditions that are in bold type are the ones that we've come to learn about uh, more recently and these have proved to be the most, most difficult to treat. Chronic pain, fibromyalgia, which is chronic pain, uh, depression and anxiety. But more about this in a moment. Um, in the 1990s, uh, our colleagues in Spain established that certain psycho psychiatric conditions were more common. 
uh, in the patients with high mobility. This is um, being confirmed with many studies from the group in Barcelona, um, panic disorder, agoraphobia, simple phobias, and social phobias are were found to be more common in various studies. Uh, and in, conversely, uh, joint laxity was found to be 16 times more common in patients with these particular psychiatric conditions. And then chronic pain, uh, an important paper from the US um, published in 1997 was the first one to really put a chronic pain in, and its uh, impact uh, in the li on the lives of people uh, with EDS. Um, if you haven't uh, seen this paper, it's worth reading it, and it it, it, it establishes that progressive chronic pain occurred in this group of 84% 80, of them uh, and um, there's been no doubt that chronic pain is now one of the most, most severe and serious aspects of, in the lives of patients with EBS mobility. This is a three uh, generational family uh, demonstrating uh, finger and hand hypermobility. The hand uh, near the top of the slide is the young teenager, the one in the middle is her mother, and the one uh, at the bottom is her grandmother. And you can see that throughout life, hypermobility persists, but it's less obvious uh, with uh, advancing years. Uh, and one reason for that is that collagen itself uh, becomes stiffer um, with age. And here you see the corresponding uh, comparison in terms of skin stretchiness, uh, which I think demonstrates the same uh, point, that um, stretchiness also becomes less apparent with advancing age. Now, there have been two um, schools uh, entering this um, uh, area. On the left you have the rheumatologist school and on the right you have the geneticist school. And there's Victor McCusick who is the father of modern genetics on the right and Eric Bywaters, my former mentor, uh, on the left. Now as time went by, um, they were walking, these two um, disciplines were progressing uh, along the similar tracks um, without unfortunately making much contact with one another. And you can see between 67 when, or 68, um, when these two conditions on the left, hypermobility syndrome on the right, uh, Ehlers-Danlos hypermobility type, were first described. You can see, especially for, towards the lower half of each overall, that studies were being published which showed very marked similarities with them. Uh, autonomic dysfunction, um, gastrointestinal problems, were, to mention a couple, were present in both groups. Now, on the rheumatology uh, side, which was my side, um, in 1998, we set up uh, a new set of criteria for diagnosis um, called the Brighton criteria. Uh, and like most similar sets of criteria, there were major and minor criteria uh, on which basis you could um, establish um, a diagnosis with a certain degree of certainty. Up till that time, um, there was no uh, clear-cut means of diagnosis. The original 1967 um, was certainly not uh, capable of being used in this purpose. And since 1998, um, I and others have worked with the Brighton criteria until it was replaced by the recent uh, set of new criteria. 
And along came uh, Brad Tinkle in 2009, uh, who joined with a few other colleagues, including myself, uh, and produced a, um, a statement which said, we can distinguish um, hypermobile EDS uh, from other forms uh, of EDS uh, and high mobility syndrome from other forms of EDS, but we can't distinguish them from one another. And from that point, uh, it became generally accepted that joint high mobility syndrome and hypermobile EDS were almost certainly identical with one another. Now, quickly, I want to go through uh, about 50 years of history. Uh, to illustrate uh, how the phenotype uh, has changed beyond recognition. In 1967, it was, it, was, it was simple. It was a musculoskeletal problem uh, with pain and instability. We didn't have to think about the symptoms, systems. Um, we weren't bodily um, system symptoms. We didn't. We weren't listening. Um, so over the next forty years, um, other evidence came to light. I've already mentioned the marfanoid habitus, the overlap, in other words, with other connective tissue disorders. I mentioned the pelvic floor problems came on, 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 on the map, chronic pain, anxiety phobias, and then came dysautonomia, gastrointestinal dysmotility. And by 2010, came along, again, another important penny dropped, as we say in England. Um, our patients were getting progressively disabled. And then from that time, we have the, uh, on, on the right lower triangle, the range has been discussed uh, over the last three days. Um, PRA1, creating a cervical instability, tethered cord, and added to that would be low CSF pressure headaches from leaking to a CSF. Because of the, um, Weaken collagen, presumably, in the uh, duomater. And then, even since then, mast cell activation, from which you've been hearing earlier today from Dr. Mason. So I turned the coin, I coined the term, I beg your pardon, the new rheumatological disability. This doesn't apply to all patients, of course not, but we're I'm talking now about the most severely affected people. They are severely physically disabled, but um, they're different from other disabled people. They don't have uh, uh, muscle disease, they don't have nerve disease, um, they don't have cerebral palsy, but they are severely disabled. Now, why should that be? The most likely explanation is this um, very intractable, uh, very untreatable chronic pain. Uh, attributed to colleagues in clinical psychology as being due to kind of fear of movement. Now, fear of movement uh, results from pain on movement and avoidance of pain on movement. So chronic pain becomes the dominant uh, factor in the decline uh, that occurs physically uh, and, of course, psychologically. But on top of that, people with this disorder do have to contend with other medical 
problems as well. Uh, briefly mentioned autonomic disorder, uh, which I know is going to be discussed later on today. Uh, gastrointestinal tract, um, gynecological, uh, and mast cell. And not to say, not even mention the neurological ones, which I mentioned earlier. Now, most of these people uh, in this rather tragic state are young and highly motivated, active people. And sadly, they're literally cut down with their prime. And just to make it worse, they're often told that it, they're imagining it, that it's all in their mind. And um, this is largely due to the fact that uh, medical health practitioners, medical specialists, have been rather unaware, we're all being unaware uh, of the enormous um, problems that occur in this condition. The fact that it is multisystemic, which we never dreamt about before. Um, patients become dispirited, feel abandoned, and often uh, very angry and in desperate situations. And up till now, there have been few centers to occur. So that's, I'm not going to dwell on that pooling, which you will no doubt hear about in the autonomic talk. Um, and there have been studies that have been published to verify that autonomic dysfunction indeed occurs. Um, and it also with gastrointestinal problems um, occurring generally under the label of dysmotility, but it can cause esophageal um, dysmotility, uh, gastroparesis, uh, slow transit uh, constipation, and um, <clears throat> certainly problems with uh, rectal evacuation. And um, it's now known that approximately 50% of people with um, irritable bowel syndrome have indeed uh, hypermobility or yes. So in summary, let's make an overview. It's a common disorder with overlap features with other connective tissue disorders. The symptoms, uh, if untreated, or if untreated, if treated in a, tend to progress over time, um, it isn't always all the joints necessarily that are hypermobile. Uh, this is a misconception. And, and you don't, um, although I'm, Dr. Tessori will probably disagree with me on this, uh, a Biden score of nine, a four or nine is, is not always essential. Uh, it's not purely an articular problem. Um, we can, uh, until the new system uh, was published a few months ago, um, classify it by the Brighton criteria as the JHS phenotype. You've got these systemic symptoms. Uh, it's a treatable disorder and demands treatment, and it significantly impairs, impairs the quality of life. Um, Hypermobility is not a diagnosis, uh, but a diagnosis is essential. Uh, and the application of appropriate treatment, for which I won't have time to dwell on, but may come up uh, during the discussion. But why is it essential that people um, caring for uh, Chiari, Chiari malformation know about EDS? Well, I think that's self-evident. Um, neurosurgeons uh, will want to know about which of their patients have EDS because uh, the presence of EDS might uh, guide them to uh, modify their surgical technique. Um, we clearly, patients with, um, sorry, health professionals who are treating patients with EDS need to know about the neurological complications. And uh, that, Patients and their families also need to know, and um, there is the pivotal role of 
what is now called the Eritrean Society, which is the world body in, in this area, is very important. Um, it's a topsy-turvy world where patients know more about the condition than their doctors. Um, that is a rather sad reflection on um, the lack of knowledge amongst many of our colleagues, sadly, uh, and indeed amongst ourselves. So how to treat the patients? Obviously, uh, we're now looking at a multidisciplinary um, approach uh, revolving specialists in many different pediatrics, gastroenterology, cardiovascular medicine, neurogynecology, neuroradiology, neurosurgery, uh, etc., as well as a whole range of therapists, uh, other specialists. Thank you.